and welcome to the Evolve with Emily Show YouTube channel. The best way to support the show on this YouTube channel is to subscribe to the channel, like the video, leave a comment, and or share it with a friend. I hope that you guys enjoy this episode in whichever way you choose to support the show. I just wanted to say from the bottom of my heart, thank you guys so much. I hope that today's message and episode brings some bit of positive change to your life. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Evolve with Emily show. I am your host, Emily Hayden, and today you are joining me for an episode where I'm interviewing Lilith Vanyatsyan. I might have said that correctly. (laughs) I gave it my best shot. Um, She is Teachers for Truth on Instagram. She's Armenian, born in Germany, grew up in Czech Republic, moved to the U.S. in 2005, began her teaching journey at the age of, of 21, graduated from George Mason University in 2019 with her bachelor's in music education, and recently has made waves in speaking at school board meetings, exposing the corrupt public school system, and empowering parents, teachers, and students all to get involved. She's a teacher from Virginia, and I'm really excited to let her do what she does best today and educate us all, educate us on what's going on in the school system and with the teachers and the students and the parents and why we should care and how we can get involved and also how we can support her in being a strong voice. You guys know that I am all about supporting other people that are speaking up for what they believe in, and I actually think that it's especially just empowering when you see strong women who aren't scared to stand up and to say what they believe in and to really stand for something really strong even when they're getting backlash. So everybody, please give a warm welcome to Lilith. Lilith, thanks for being on the show today. Good to see you, Emily. So stoked for this. So just a little backstory. It's pretty funny because this last year has led me to a bunch of people that I probably would have never been connected with otherwise, but we met each other at the Veterans Outreach Workout event. And the funny thing is I was already following Lilith and I just didn't realize it because I guess I just read most of your um, written posts and I would share them and all sorts of stuff. So I didn't realize it was you when we met initially. And then later you were like, oh, you're already following me. And I was like, oh, I guess I am. (laughs) So it was really cool to get to connect in person. And what you guys see online with Lilith, this strong, fiery, passionate voice, literally the same, if not more in person. (laughs) It was really dope. I'm glad that we got to experience it and that I got to connect with you there. Yeah. So, okay. Well, I would like to do what you do best, which is educate and kind of teach us about what's going on with the school system and why we should care. But before we get there, I actually want to dive into your heart's posture behind getting into education. What made you, Lilith, interested in being an educator, which I think is such a huge responsibility because you're shaping and molding the next generation of lawyers and doctors and, you know, all these incredible people. So what made you want to be an educator? That's a great question. Um, I wanted to become an educator because I want to help people. I love people. I want to help them, but I knew I couldn't help them in the capacity as a nurse or a doctor because I just can't look at blood, but <laughs> yeah, I... that's probably, <laughs> probably a requirement. <laughs> exactly. But I was a band geek growing up and I was so connected with music and I was able to find myself like band was my niche growing up. I didn't have friends. I was bullied every day. I like, it just, I was able to find myself in music and it was sort of a light bulb moment sitting in band one day. It was like junior year and I'm watching my band director conduct and I'm like, I could do this this is fun. This is actually fun. But most importantly, you can connect people and still teach them lifelong skills through music. And again, it was so personal for me because I couldn't connect with math. I couldn't connect with history. I couldn't connect with science, but I could connect with music and you can make such long lasting relationships as a athletic coach, as a fine arts director, as a band teacher. So that's what I wanted to do is help the next generation through music. What instrument did you play? Flute. I played flute for a little while too. Do you still play? Heck yeah. (laughs) Oh, that's great. So, okay. What do you teach now? Um, So I'm currently out of the system and we will definitely open up that can of worms. So I'm giving private music instruction on flute, piano, guitar, and I'm also tutoring kids of families that have homes for homeschooling their kids have pulled out of the system themselves. Wow. That's incredible. So, okay, let's kind of dive into, you know, last year, 2020, when all of this started to come about. Um, Can you kind of explain how things started to change within the school system? Yeah. So it 
became so, I don't even know what word I would use, but everything was so sudden. They started with the two weeks. We're going to close down the schools for two weeks. And that was the only thing that I, you know, really brought from the government. I said, okay, fine, two weeks. We're, we're going to be out of school for two weeks and then we'll go back. And then it was another two weeks and it was a month and it was two months and it was three months. So first they started to really show their true colors by shutting down the schools, refusing um, access to, you know, quality education for your kids. Mm -hmm. um, but then last summer we saw with, the summer of love and that kind of sparked where we are today with critical race theory mm -hmm. anti-white curriculum mm -hmm. transgender curriculum safe space for all unless you vote for this person i mean it started with the shutdowns and then it just riled up from there so when they initially shut down the schools all of the parents were like we have to go back we have to go back to school we got to get our kids back to school five days a week and i was like no no, you don't. This is your time as a parent of your child to really listen to what is actually being taught. Mm -hmm. This is your time from the comfort of your kitchen counter to wow. really, really, really hone in on what are these teachers telling your children? Don't beg for them to go back to school. They'll go back eventually, mm -hmm. but you now have direct access to their laptop mm -hmm. and to Zoom. Wow. You know, it's funny because I think you know, when you think about what people do every single day, most of what we do is unconscious. So even when you think about parents who have kids, they think, well, kids go to school, so I'm going to send them off to school. And if they never have something to bring their awareness to the sense that you might want to check what's being taught to your children, they may mm -hmm. never have that awareness. So I think this, if anything, can be such a great wake up call to people and to parents to say, you know, I really need to be involved and in, in aware of what's going on, aware of how my children are being educated and molded and shaped because truly what you teach them they will repeat right I think I heard you say in an interview once you were like <laughs> if if you teach children to be scared of grass they're going to be scared yeah. of grass and it really makes it so evident because I think those learning years are so de developmental and so important to who they shape up to be because you're raising the next adults that we're going to have in society, you know, the next coworkers and bosses and everything in between. So uh, I guess my next question for you then is with parents now becoming more aware to what's going on in the school system, did you start to see any sort of shift within um, – I guess the allowance of what was going on, like as parents became aware, what did you start to notice? I started to notice that parents were putting their political indifferences aside and saying, you're teaching my kid what? You're telling my kids to not hang out with so-and-so because of their skin color. You're separating kids during lunch because of what? I mean, parents were like, wait a minute, you are doing this to my child who gave you permission. Yeah. So when the shutdowns happened again, I was like, you guys, this is a silver lining. This is literally your chance, your opportunity to really get involved in what they're saying. Like you, you can literally just, again, comfort of your kitchen counter, listen to what the teachers are telling your kids. And over zoom, these teachers have nothing to hide. This is how irrational they are. Over Zoom, teachers would, you know, make remarks about like, oh, yeah, this is going to remain in our class and our class only. In other words, you will not tell your parents what is being taught in this class. Oh, wow. Yes. But and this is, I mean. Do the, do, do, the, do the children abide by that? I feel like children say anything and everything. Yes and no. So this is where this is where it becomes really dangerous with the social justice warrior teachers that we have in the classroom that are infiltrating the vulnerable minds of kids mm -hmm. is that if they are able to twist and manipulate your kid to the point where your child bonds with you more than they bond with their parents at home, they will listen to you like God. Wow. Wow. Yeah, what a it's power very position to be in. I mean, I feel like people who are power hungry would eat that up in all the wrong ways. Um, mm -hmm. So one thing that you've been very strong in your stance in is critical race theory. So can you talk a little bit about that and, you know, your opinion on it and why you think it's something that we really need to address here? Yeah, so critical race theory, I believe, started in the 70s. There are some there's some research that, it, you know, came about earlier than that. But 
the idea of critical race theory is literally, if you listen to what it is, critical race theory, that everything is bound to race. Every The, the founding of this country, the foundation tree, the, the the principles of this country, our founding fathers, the 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 founding documents of this country, everything was rooted in racism, and um, the institutions are naturally racist. Mm -hmm. The way that the law works is racist. Our just this system is racist. The laws and foundations of this country are racist, and the system works in a way to limit the success of black people and we're teaching that in, in, in school mind you we're telling second graders that you cannot amount to anything because you're black so wow. the system is naturally against you wow. meanwhile we have teachers who are black that have three phds mm -hmm. so you're telling me that what they are their victims they couldn't accomplish you know receiving three doctorate degrees because of their skin color mm -hmm. So critical race theory, just in a nutshell, is that everything is tied to race. The foundation, the founding of this country is racist. And if you're white, you are born with a natural set of, um, um, you're born privileges. with a natural set of criteria, privileges, thank you, privileges that other people don't have. Mm. And so then you break it down and you look at some vocabulary terms that we throw out in curriculum. We use microaggressions, white supremacy, um, um, all these other things that our kids are like, I don't even know what that is. Right. You know, our kids can't even, my high schoolers are graduating, not knowing how to read. And you're, you want them to know what a microaggression is. I couldn't even tell you what a microaggression is. Wow. That's incredible. You know, one of the things that I work on with my clients, you know, I'm in the personal development, fitness and health world is we work on limiting beliefs and limiting beliefs become a part of you be based on your trauma, based on your teachers, your parents, your relative life experience. And so we really dig deep and figure out how these limiting beliefs are only true because you believe them to be true. And when you believe them to be true, you match your energy and your actions to them. So if we take these kids at a very young age and give them these limiting beliefs that they believe are true, they're going to match their energy and their actions with it. And it becomes a self-fulfilling mm -hmm. prophecy so you know I'm here doing the work with a lot of people many years later in their life in their adulthood but man if we could just start at the beginning start at the childhood education to empower them to show them that they are capable of their dreams and of everything that they want to go after what kind of results would we see because here's the thing if you were to empower the children in that way they would match their energy and their actions to the fact that they can do whatever they set their mind to that if they set right. their mind to it they put their actions behind it and they they believe with everything in them that they can do it that kind of result is going to be so much different than a result that says you signed up to lose because that's what I and hear. that's the whole point that's the whole point but that, that's why they come after your kids as early as not even first grade kindergarten we're talking pre-k they come after your kids as young as they you know have functioning brain cells to teach them how to become, you know, social justice warriors, how to become activists. I mean, there's, this is not even private hidden information. This mm -hmm. is out there. There's literally Instagram accounts that are showing you how they teach their kids to be activists. There's one on Instagram. I think if I haven't been blocked by them by now, I'm surprised. Mm -hmm. It's called woke kindergarteners. Oh goodness. Kindergarteners. Good. And back in 2015 or I think it was 2016 when President Trump won the election. She filmed and posted a video of her kindergartners walking or storming around the uh, room with signs that they made, which who taught them how to make signs? Their teacher did. Who taught them how to write the things that are written on the signs? Their teacher did. Mm -hmm. They're chanting around the room, no Donald Trump, no Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. Wow. Why is that? Why, why, why is there any politics in the classroom, let alone in kindergarten? kindergartners? My goodness. You talk a lot about preserving the vulnerability um, and the innocence of our children. And I am on board with that. But can you explain a little bit more why that's so important and how you believe we do that? We do that by really focusing on the, um, the creative minds of our kids. These kids are learning, right? So again, what I said before was if you teach a child to be afraid of grass, they will be because they their minds haven't been molded yet. Our brains don't even fully develop until we're what, 25. Mm -hmm. So if you are going to be a role model for them, whether it's a positive or negative role model for them, these kids are too young to be able to distinguish 
um, is my mommy being a good role model for me or bad? But that's all they know, right? So the first lessons that they learn are at home. Mm-hmm. I can stress school all day long. Mm-hmm. I can, you know, I can talk about education all day long, but it ultimately starts at home. And if they're not getting, you know, if, if, if they are coming from a broken home, if they are coming from a lifestyle where their parents are ultimately not involved, they're not even in the, in the, in the picture, you have isolated your child already. You have already set your child up for failure in their adulthood. Mm-hmm. So the way that we hone into their um, vulnerability is by allowing them to express themselves, allowing them to, do, to question things, allowing them to find themselves. Mm-hmm. So in other words, I always talk about indoctrination versus education. Indoctrination is when you tell a child or anybody for that matter how to think. You should educate the kid and just tell them, think. That's Mm. it, think. I won't tell you how to think, but I will just encourage you to think. (sighs) Don't just take what I am saying to to, to be everything. You know, I give my students the ability to be teachers because this is their education. This is their time to shine. Who am I to just stand in front of the room all day, every day and be the spotlight and tell them this, 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 think this. It's like, okay, well, what do you think? Mm, That's powerful. That's huge. And I think we need more of that. We need more people that can critically think because if we have people critically thinking, then they can take in information and do their own research, do their own thinking and decide what's best for them. Whereas right now I almost feel like we have a bunch of walking zombies that are just repeating whatever it is that they see, right? They have the government telling them to do something and they don't even question it once. They don't even look at, does this logically make sense? They just blindly follow everything. So you have to look at, okay, if we we want people to critically think and to raise questions and ask questions. I think it does start in the younger years. What are we doing to shape people to show them that they should ask questions, that it's good and accepted to ask questions? Mm-hmm. Um, and what you said actually gave me chills about how the difference between indoctrination and education is saying think rather than Mm -hmm. telling them what to think. I think that's so powerful. And I think everyone listening, whether it is a child or adult or anywhere in between, always ask yourself, who is encouraging you to ask more questions? And who is just simply telling you that this is how it is no matter what and that they're right and they know everything? Because anyone that's going to sit here and tell you that they know everything and that they don't ever ask questions, they are people you should stay far away from. Go towards the people that raise your curiosity, that get you to ask more questions, that ask thought-provoking questions not just tell you exactly what to believe and to think and take it even a step further right I always get asked why is what's happening in the schools happening okay well think about it what are they doing to the kids right now and this is a whole nother can of worms we can get into later if you want Mm -hmm. they are masking your children Mm -hmm. they are saying you they are okay right here in Virginia our student athletes must take the needle Okay. No way. They must take the they must take the needle in order to participate in, in school sports, or you must comply and get weekly testing, or weekly or biweekly testing. So, why is what's happening in a school happening? Because we, as early as again pre K kindergarten, we are telling the kids what to think, mm-hmm. so that when they get to a certain age, a certain uh, developmental year in their life, they have been so. Uh, they've been so used to just listening what people tell them that their brains have no capacity to question what is being told to them. Mm -hmm. So now they're getting to ready, getting ready to graduate high school. Okay. The government coerced them and their family coerced them to cover their faces for a year and a half and to take an experimental drug. Now they're going to graduate. They're going to go out into the real world and they're going to do whatever the government tells them to. If they become a law enforcement officer Mm -hmm. and the government tells them, you must go knocking on people's doors and put a gun to their head or tell them they have to take the needle, they're going to do it. They're going to go into the military. The military is going to give them orders. You must do this. And they're going to say, okay, Mm -hmm. that's what's happening right now. It's all the young recruits because they have been raised to just take, uh, just to take instruction from people and not question, is it right? Mm -hmm. Is it ethical? Is it moral? Can I even do it? Mm -hmm. 
Wow, you just brought up such a great point. Um, I think right now, more than ever, people who are in positions like law enforcement officers, they're in such a crucial position where, and same with like the military, you have to ask, you know, who did I make my oath to, right? My oath is not to the government, it's actually to the people. It's to protect and to serve at all costs, even if the enemy lies within our own land. So I think it's important to, you know, encourage them to ask those questions for themselves. Like you're, if you're that person that's in that position of a law enforcement or a military or anything in between emergency personnel or nurses or doctors, really ask yourself, are you just listening to the government? Are you just listening to these mandates that are being given out? But or, or are you really looking at the overall community? Are you looking at the community that you love and serve and protect and have an oath to take care of? Right. I think, you know, we had a nurse recently on the show, Nurse Nicole, who she's been deleted from everything now. Um, so we're hoping that she I think she I should have some contact information for her soon. So I did want to mention that I'm in contact with her awesome. um, to give you guys some to where to follow and support her. Um, but as of right now, you know, she was really mentioning how in her field in the in the you know field of nurses and doctors and everyone in there, so many people are just willing to follow whatever the status quo is, whatever the next mandate out is, and they even though they don't agree with it, like they actually don't agree with it, but they're being scared and shoved into a corner of being you know forced into these decisions and these mandates and things that they don't even themselves believe. And I think that the way that we're going to see change is by more people like yourself and like her who are in their respective fields standing up speaking out and saying hey like something's not right here and I think it Mm -hmm. doesn't take a lot of figuring out to figure out that something's off maybe we don't know everything maybe we don't know exactly what the plan is or the scheme is but something's not right and I think it is really important we're in such a crucial time in history where we have to stand up and say something we have to have these conversations because if we don't where does that road lead And I always try to look at what is the path that we're on and what is the end result of this? What is the end result of a community that masks their children and yet the elite are at parties unmasked? The same principals and teachers that are enforcing this are at parties unmasked. Like what kind of hypocrisy is that? There's so much hypocritical things happening right now. And I think it's going to take people like you and like I and like her and the other people that are brave and speaking out to really lead the way and do this. So I do want to say, you know, thank you. And I commend you for being a leader. You know, I think I also heard you you say, yeah, I also heard you say in an interview once that it actually doesn't take that many of us to stand up and speak out because what did you notice once you started to speak out at the school board? So the first time I spoke out was in March. And then after I spoke out, there's a teacher who I'm really good friends with right now. His name is Jeremy. He's a teacher in Loudoun County. He's been speaking every single school board meeting, literally. And with him, there was another teacher that came and another teacher that came. This is just one part of one state in one part of the country, right? Mm -hmm. But also what kind of hypocrites are we? If we expect our children, right? We teach our kids, whether you're a parent or whether you're a teacher, we teach our kids, you know, you want to be a leader, you want to go out into the real world and do this and do that. What kind of hypocrites are we if we can't model that for them? Mm -hmm. Our kids are looking up to us. And and when I say our kids, I don't even have kids of my own. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I literally, take so much pride in this because everyone's kids are my kids. They're your kids too, Emily. They're, they're Mm. the future of this country, of this world. So what kind of hypocrite would you and I be if we looked at the youth and we said, you should be the next leaders. You are the next leaders of this generation, but they don't even know what that is. What is a leader? Mm. And they look up to mommy and daddy because they are their immediate leaders. What is mommy and daddy doing? They're putting them in a hazmat suit. They're sending them off to school with it. I know, honey, I know you don't like it, but we just, we have no other choice. Yeah. That's, that's wild. And I agree. People uh, or sorry, excuse me, children, they learn from what they're shown. Right. So as a parent, you can tell them what to do all day long. But if you're not living that out in your real life, they're not going to take it to heart. It's like the parent right. that tries to put their kid on a diet and yet they're eating like crap. You think they're going to want to yeah. live a healthy lifestyle when you're not embodying that yourself? Like the way that you lead is you lead from the front. You lead with your actions. And I think it's more important now than ever that you have a backbone and you stand up and you show your children, whether it's your physical children or your community's children, what it's like to be a leader and to not be scared to experience the backlash. Have you experienced backlash in your own teaching community or what has been um, some of the responses that you've given or gotten both good and bad? Oh gosh. Um, I get 
asked that question a lot and I tend to never really even focus on the negatives just Amen. because just because I mean look at just you and I like mm-hmm. we're sit- like we met at Ian Smith's Veterans Outreach Workout mm-hmm. we met incredible people there and we're sharing this vibe right now mm-hmm. like yes I received backlash I don't even want to get into that Amen. because it doesn't phase me it doesn't do anything to me I'm here I'm alive I have a roof over my head um, and I'm still teaching and it doesn't matter that I am not in the corrupt system. I'm still educating young minds. I'm still going out of my way to drive to homes and to give, oh. you know, quality education. So I don't care about the backlash. Mm-hmm. It does nothing to me. That's beautiful. I actually just did a podcast on it. How, you know, recently um, I had some people reaching out saying that I was receiving a lot of backlash and the person reaching out said, I'm so furious. And so I wrote back and said, then don't watch it. And she was I like, she was like, oh yeah. And, and I told her, I was like, I've had a great day. I just had a great workout. I did a podcast. I'm doing yeah. this and that I've had the most positive day. There's no chance in hell. I'm going to go listen to what someone's saying about me. Yeah. So I love that. That's your instant response. Cause <laughs> it really just shows you we're so in control of so many things in life, right? We're, we're not in control of a lot, but we are in control of how we respond to things and which things we allow into our minds and hearts. So I am just, I love the fact that you don't even want to spend a second on this podcast <laughs> talking about that because that makes my heart so happy and that's you literally living that out and embodying that so amen sister (laughs) okay so I actually want to get into um talking about the I can't remember the term you'll have to remind me um but it's Mm -hmm. the I think it's like the elected officers at the school or something like that like the the school yeah, elected right. officers, the school board right? Members or the um, the um, police officers themselves, I guess, that work at schools. Do they have like a certain school term? resource officers? Yes. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. School resource officer. So, could you explain why you believe that they are important and a valuable part of the education system? Okay, so let me paint a picture. You have in today's age because we just passed this policy here in Loudoun County about four weeks ago. It's Bill eighty forty. Um, Let me paint you a picture. You have a child, a daughter. She is in eighth grade or ninth grade, and she goes into the bathroom, and a boy walks into the bathroom after her. I mean, no one else is in the bathroom. It's just her. She's trying to mind her own business, and then a boy walks in. It's clearly a boy. Mm -hmm. But the boy is allowed to go into that bathroom because the state has said, well, if you feel like a girl that day, you can go into the girl's bathroom. If you feel like a boy the next day, you can go into the boy's bathroom. You can do whatever you feel most comfortable and safe doing is that safe for your daughter because there have been so many instances where that boy has gone into the bathroom of a girl and has done unimaginable things to her so if we defund our school school resource officers which we have and are continuing to do across the country who the heck is supposed to come to her aid a school counselor a guidance counselor our school guidance counselors don't even do the job that they already have Mm. You expect them to be able to deal with the trauma of that child. This is a legal matter now. Mm. Why was why was that boy allowed to go into a girl's bathroom and sexually assault her? Mm. Whose responsibility is that going to be? And who is going to be the best person to come and mitigate that issue? It's going to be law enforcement. Mm-hmm. I also heard you say how important it is for them to build relationships with the students there and how that can actually help with when you get outside of school, right? Being able to have a healthy relationship with a law enforcement officer, I think is so important. But what you're saying here, you know, I don't have my own physical child, but I already want to murder someone just hearing that, (laughs) you know, and I don't (laughs) care if it's the political, the political correct thing to say. That's how I feel, right? right? Like that's the feeling that it induces in me because I'm a protector at heart. You know, I have nieces and nephews and just children that I love, right? I would never want harm to come to them. And I think that we just right now live in such an upside down world where now we are making them susceptible to something that's going to cause lifelong trauma. That's something that nobody and no female, no male should ever experience under any circumstances. And now we're essentially just giving these perpetrators an open door to, here you go, here's your chance. For sure. And here's another picture I would like to paint for you. Um, There's so many pictures I could paint, Emily. I'm a horrible artist. So it's going to be just as visualized. (laughs) I can, okay. (laughs) Um, But what is a school resource officer also, um, what what does their role also do in in a school system? So if you have a child that has been, that has faced some kind of 
trauma in their life, whether they are facing neglect at school or they're facing neglect at home. We all know these kinds of kids at school, right? Like they are the kid that nobody knows their name. Mm. They just kind of sit in the corner in the lunch cafeteria by themselves. They grow out their hair to cover their face because that's how they feel safe and protected away from everybody else. They have a journal where they draw very dark images, right? Because that's what's going on in their mind. That's how they feel. They might even be cutting themselves. You don't know what these kids are going through. Mm. If that kid does not get the kind, the, the, the necessary care, attention, love, and treatment, that kid comes to school one day with a guitar case mm. that does not have a guitar in it. Mm. It has an AR. Wow. And then he is now the next headline that he is a school shooter. Mm. So a school shooter comes into the school. We don't have any school resource officers. It, it's already going to take 10 minutes, I don't know, for local police department to show up and um, come to the school site where the school shooting has happened. Uh, we're not allowed, as teachers, we're not allowed to have pepper spray, taser, bear mace, nothing, let alone a firearm. So let me just paint you that picture. If, if we don't care about the, the boys going into the girl scenario, let's say we don't have that issue. Let's say we don't even care about it. Let's say we're okay with that. That's just how little we care. What about the physical damage that can come from a school shooter. Mm. How are we supposed to prevent that? We don't even have proper drills at school. Lock wow. your door, shut the lights off, huddle up in a corner, pray to God that you don't get shot and killed. I, 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 I'm I, sorry, like I probably should have given a, you know, warning that that was gonna be very explicit for, for some listeners, but this is exactly the fear that I would have going into school every day. That's actually, how I went from anti-gun to pro-gun. I really? realized that, yes. I so you were anti-gun. Oh yeah, and, I'm very anti-gun. Yeah, so tell me about that switch and what made it switch for you and why you were so anti-gun and why now you're not. I was anti-gun because I, going to school to teach every day, I was like, all right, well, I don't know if I'm gonna go home today, right? I mean, that could happen anywhere. You could go into a grocery store, a movie theater, a mall, anything can happen anytime. You're not invincible, but the fact that we have a sign right before you get into the parking lot that says gun-free zone, that is just a welcoming sign to a criminal. Mm -hmm. So the reason I was anti-gun, because I was like, well, let's just take the guns away. I don't want little Timmy coming into my classroom with a gun. Like, can't we just get rid of it? Mm -hmm. But uh, some people in my life started to challenge my thoughts and I started asking questions and I was friends with people that were gun owners. And so I just started getting into that community and I realized it's not it's not about the gun. If it's about the gun, then this pencil mm -hmm. that you used to fail my test, we should ban the pencil because it's the pencil that gave you a horrible grade on this test, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So to wrap it up, I mean, that's why we need SROs. We need protection. And, and if anything, they're able to create such long lasting relationships mm -hmm. with our kids, even our most traumatized kids, mm -hmm. they don't get along with maybe some of their homeroom teachers or their parents at home, but some random cool guy with tattoos and a firearm on his hip, you're able to connect with that guy because he doesn't give you grades. He doesn't, you know, he doesn't, um, he, he doesn't, uh, suspend you. Mm -hmm. He doesn't ground you. He's just some person or she. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's beautiful. And I think, you know, what you're bringing up, yes, they are severe topics and heavy topics to talk about. But I think these exact situations and pictures that you're painting are important to talk about because it gets people thinking, right? It gets people thinking about these possibilities and what kind of situations they want to create or avoid in their lives, right? Whether it's the bathroom example or this other example that you brought up. So I think they're both valid and there's things that should be talked about and addressed because I don't know about you guys, but for me, if I had my own physical child going to school, these are things I would think about every single day, mm -hmm. every single day. I would want to know and feel feel like my child was looked after, cared for, protected. I would never want to get a phone call for either of those situations, you know, or any of the situations in between. So I think everything that we can do to protect our children and our teachers, you know, it's some of the most important work that we could do. So I, I love how focused you are on protecting the child and looking out for the children who maybe are neglected, like you said, at home, right? The ones that are alone in the lunchroom and things like that, because I think oftentimes, you know, the people and parents that maybe are a little bit more unconscious with their thinking right now, they may not know that their child is the child at school sitting alone in the yeah. lunchroom. 
not talking with no friends and then they come home yeah. and they don't know why they have an attitude it's because they just had a hell of a day at school right yeah. so um s- with all of this happening in the school system and the shifts that happened we saw a large uh, decrease from people that were going to school to now a large increase of people switching into homeschooling so can you talk a little bit about that shift and <laughs> I see you already wanting to go so yeah talk about that <laughs> shift and what you've seen I have like 25 tabs open on my monitor here Amazing. to like toggle and get some statistics for you guys. So yeah, please do. Um, homeschooling wasn't always a very popular, you know, uh, option. I think it was a weird stigma. Even five years ago, if somebody told me that they're homeschooling their child, I'd be like, what intonation is wrong with you? Also, I was homeschooled just so we can throw that out there. <laughs> <laughs> perfect. Perfect. You're one of them. I'm one no, of them. But- but I was like, why would you do that to your kid? Like, mm-hmm. leave them in the school. They they have no social life. If you homeschool, you're totally, totally not right at all. Mm-hmm. Um, so on average, each year homeschooling, you'd see like two to per, two to 8% growth in homeschooling in the past few years um, in the U.S. K through 12. Mm-hmm. So by 2019, there were about 2.5 million children who opted for homeschooling. That number by the end of last year in 2020 went up to 9 million. Wow. Wow. Oh my goodness. And if you want to even sharpen the scope a little bit more, make it more local. um, So I live in Virginia, in Northern Virginia, to be more specific, Fairfax County uh, District, which where I worked last year, uh, Fairfax County has about 180 something thousand students. Last year, in the first two to three months of school, 15,000 families pulled out. Wow. 15,000 families. And Fairfax is right next to Loudoun County, which Loudoun County has been on the news for like almost a year now. Mm-hmm. Loudoun County has about 84,000 students, and I believe eight to 10,000 have pulled out. This is the richest county in the country, mm-hmm. by the way. So this doesn't even have anything to do with it's a red state. It's a blue state. It's a purple state. It's a, they're rich, they're poor. It's black and white. It's not, it's about your kids are suffering and parents have had enough. Mm. And if you don't see the schools fighting to give a quality, it's, you know what? It's not even, Oh man, we've put so much effort on CRT. I'm sorry, you guys, it's no longer about CRT. Mm. CRT is the tip of the iceberg. CRT means absolute Jack black. If you cannot send your child off to school as a normal human being anymore. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I think it's time for us to shift and not be so focused on CRT because we tend to have this lifestyle, this pattern where something happens in this country and we focus on that Mm -hmm. forever. Mm -hmm. Biden trips up the stairs on air force one for like four months, people are making memes about it, move on, do something. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, after the election, we spent all these months trying to fight the election and all this, like, just, just move on. You've got to get ahead of the game. You have to get ahead of the game to fight the next. And that comes right now in schools at CRT, but that is just a tip of the iceberg. Your kids can't breathe Mm -hmm. for eight hours a day. First graders are coming home with snot and vomit in their masks. Wow. Do you think that kids are going to feel comfortable raising their hand to ask their teacher for a napkin to blow their nose? Or are they just going to hide behind their mask and do it in their mask? Oh, my God. They come home with breadcrumbs in their mask. I mean, they are breathing this all day, every day. Now, let's say that the masks are perfectly clean, whatever, right? What is it doing to them psychologically? Mm -hmm. So CRT or psychological health, Mm -hmm. CRT or mental health, CRT Mm -hmm. or obesity. These kids are actually getting heavier and heavier. It's harder for them to breathe. They're wearing masks in PE. Mm -hmm. They're running less and they're running slower. They're doing less physical activity because the demands and the strains of their face being covered. So CRT or the overall health of my Mm -hmm. child. Add to that the forced needles. Mm. Uh, was it LA County is now forcing everybody to get the needle? Wow. I think LA County, LA USD is demanding all their employees to get the needle. It's happening here. I, I think starting October 1st, you must provide uh, proof of uh, the V mm-hmm. if you're a teacher to submit to biweekly testing. So Sorry if I got off on a tangent, but I just want your listeners to maybe if you're a parent or a teacher or whatever, if you're just a community advocate, 
don't be so honed in on CRT. It's not CRT that's ruining this country. It's us being told that we have to cover our face Mm -hmm. and we have to take an experimental drug. Mm -hmm. That's it. And it's happening to your most vulnerable kids. How do people fight back? People always ask, I wish it was something I could do. So if they're a parent listening, if they're a student listening, how do they join the fight in standing against it? Okay, so I have have four websites. Um, This is great. Okay, so I have a couple of, I know, I could literally do this for like, I could just talk for years if you don't throw (laughs) a rock at me. Um, So if you want to get more information on resources and organizations in your local area that are fighting against CRT and indoctrination in your area, the first website is undoctrinate.org. They have a list of organizations in your in schools and universities that are fighting against CRT. That's the first step is just to like, you know, educate yourself on what is what's happening. The second one is called what are they learning.com. This is an interactive map of what is actually being taught in your district. Oh, so cool. okay. you go, mm-hmm, you go to what are they learning.com, you click on your state, you click on your school district, and you can see upload of curriculum, uh, you know, curriculum that has been uploaded of what's being taught in that school district. And you can act- actually upload your own information there as well. The third one is parentsagainstcrt.com. This was found by a parent here in Loudoun County. His name is Scott. They have, he has a CRT glossary. So people are like, how do I know if CRT is being taught in my school? It doesn't say critical race theory anywhere. Mm-hmm. Well, hold on. You have to get ahead of the game. Remember how I said get ahead of the game? Mm-hmm. Don't look for critical race theory. Look for other words like cultural proficiency, mm-hmm. social emotional learning, mm-hmm. diversity, equity, inclusion. This is my favorite. Culturally responsive teaching, <gasps> CRT. Wow. There's another one, restorative justice, you know, social justice, anything that means they're teaching your child divisive information. Mm -hmm. The fourth website is heritageaction.com slash issues. They have a toolkit on how to reject CRT. And they also walk you through how to submit a FOIA request. That's your freedoms of information act. So if you're a parent in a school district and you want to know what curriculum is being taught or what training are they putting the teachers through because they want to indoctrinate us first. I Mm -hmm. want to make that very, very, very clear for people. They put teachers through quote unquote professional training to indoctrinate us first before we indoctrinate your kids. So if you want to submit a FOIA request, you can submit one and see what's actually being taught and being funneled into your child's backpack. Real quickly, in addition to that, what would you say to teachers that are undergoing that training that are sitting there with kind of a question mark on their head, like, hey, something feels off or not right here, yet they're looking around and the other group of teachers is just, they're all going with it. What would you say to those teachers? Yeah, it's tough. I mean, I had that moment last year over the summer, I was sitting through training and it was all the music teachers in the district. We were, you know, put into breakout groups on Google Classroom and it was like a breakout group of like 10 other music teachers or something. And no lie, these teachers were debating teaching the national anthem because it is, quote, rooted in racism, unquote. And like, I was like, I don't know what to say. Like at that time, I didn't know how to be vocal in an appropriate way because I didn't want to just lose my job right away. But the best thing that you can do is, you know, send a message. Sometimes you have no idea who agrees with you unless you just openly communicate. That's huge. Your principal might not even know what's going on. I can't tell you how many times parents have found um, a book that their middle schooler was reading for English. And it's about, I'm sure you've seen this going around. It's called 642 Reasons. Mm -hmm. And it's like writing prompts. I can't can't even repeat the prompts that are in there. It's just so vulgar and sexually explicit. Mm -hmm. But I can't tell you how many times parents will go to the principal and the principal's like, I had no idea. Wow. Now, of course, what the heck? Why do you not know? It's your freaking school, right? right? But as a teacher, just reach out to your principal and say, or your whoever your admin is and say, hey, I wanted to discuss something that was mentioned in um, our professional development today. So maybe what I would have done when they were talking about how the national anthem is rooted in racism and how our kids don't feel comfortable maybe reciting the pledge because they're immigrants. I'm an immigrant. I've lived in this amazing country for 16 years and I pledge my life to this country. So 
I've never felt the need to sit down during a pledge because it's not the Armenian pledge or it doesn't, you know, have anything that makes me feel good about myself too bad. It's about how you as an American are going to fight to uphold the freedoms and constitution of this country. Mm -hmm. That is what the pledge is for. It is to thank and to remind ourselves of the freedoms that we have, the fact that we are even able to receive a free public education. Mm -hmm. So I would maybe just make it very personal and just, you know, don't be rude, don't attack, mm -hmm. you know, don't be defensive or, or agitating or anything. Just say, I didn't feel comfortable about this being brought up because da, 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 da. When and you document everything, document mm -hmm. every single conversation you have with admin, with your coworkers, whether you're a parent or a teacher and you're communicating with a school, document everything, have everything in writing, have everything printed out for documentation to cover yourself. Such good tips. Thank you. And what you're mentioning is so important, regardless of what community or profession you're in. Um, you're mentioning how you don't know who agrees with you until you open your mouth and say something. So something like just sending a message or like you said, just mentioning, you know, this kind of made me feel uncomfortable because X, Y, Z might open that conversation for someone else to say, oh, thank God, I was sitting here holding my breath, you know, and I'm yeah. glad that you said it. And what that does is now you're able to connect with other people that share the same values and beliefs that you do. You know, I have spoken to a lot of people throughout this whole thing where they didn't believe in wearing a mask. They stood up against it and someone else saw them do it and then said, oh, I don't either. And then they followed <laughs> suit. Yeah. Right. And it takes that person of being brave enough to say something. Whereas if you just stay quiet and you look around, you're going to think that everyone else is with it and that they're complying. Mm -hmm. And in reality, a lot of people aren't with it, but they don't really have the courage yet to stand up. So have that courage, be the person that speaks out and you'll get to know who, you know, who your like-minded thinking people are. Right. And what's great is when that happens, it opens up so many doorways because once you realize that you're like-minded in your thinking and beliefs, if you need resources or help, guess who's going to be there to help you? Exactly. The, the person who has those same beliefs and values. You know, I've spoken to some nurses and doctors who have been giving advice saying, you know, to other nurses and doctors, like, don't give up hope that a reformation of things is not coming because the truth is there's a lot of us that think the same way and if they're going to take this route in the medicine field then you know what we're going to create our own with quite the opposite approach so exactly and you would never know that if you didn't just speak on it no we had a teacher here tanner cross who was suspended when he spoke at a school board meeting in lieu of the transgender policy that they were going to pass and they did pass he said, I cannot agree to this policy of my religious views. And they suspended him. They tried to fire him. He took it to court. He won the case. But now he's still battling in court to actually keep his job. But he's now also fighting the actual, you know, policy itself. And, you know, you've gone against your First Amendment rights. And there's a group of teachers that are filing lawsuits. I mean, this is happening everywhere. But, like, imagine if that didn't happen to him. Imagine if I didn't speak at a school board meeting which by the way, I spoke without a face diaper. Mm -hmm. Everybody in that room, hundreds of parents in that room were for some reason, don't know why wearing a face diaper. Mm. I would say maybe 300 people there. Can you imagine wow. if they just didn't? Wow. I went, up to, I went up to speak and the chairman of the school board started to question me if I had a medical exemption. Mm -hmm. And she said, I want to wait to get a thumbs up from the staff that you have a medical exemption. Otherwise, you can't speak. I was like, oh, that's funny. That's against HIPAA. Mm -hmm. And I stood my ground and I proved my point. I got my full minute back. I made my speech. But in real life time, I showed everybody in that room mm -hmm. that you can do it. You don't need to wear it. But guess what? They all wore it anyway. Wow. They also went up there wearing it anyway. So if you can't do it in a comfortable setting like that, where you're all in the room together, if you can't just rip it off your face there, I don't want to hear the talk of civil wars coming. Mm -hmm. Really? I don't think you're going to be able to fight that. Mm -hmm. I don't think you're going to be able to fight that if you can't be the role model for your child. How do you expect your child to go to school wearing it if you can't even take it off in a room mm -hmm. full of 300 people who are packed in there like sardines? You know, don't make a mockery of yourself, but you have to jump the train now. And these are the same people who will go to an official meeting, put a mask on, and yet in yep. their social circles, they're going to parties and different things, not wearing a mask. 
And so the whole yeah. point is like, clearly you're not with it. Like if you're with it, fine, do your thing. But if you're not really with it, then don't pretend to be with it in the, in the situations that matter the most. I feel like those situations are the ones that matter the most. Like, like you said, imagine if 300 people walked into that room without the mask. Yeah. What would Literally. Happen? So, okay, I want to segue a little bit. We've mentioned it quite a few times, um, but something that has been making its rounds on social media especially is the highlight of the sex education in the school system and just some of the things that are being taught and read, a lot of it through literature. So as a teacher, what is kind of your stance on what's being educated, or if you can call it that, um, with our children in the sex ed realm? Okay, so sex ed as you and I know it when we were in school was like, we separate the boys, we separate the girls into separate rooms. The boys have their lesson on what goes on in their bodies and, you know, puberty and all this stuff and, 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 you know, safe sex, blah, blah, blah. And then the girls get their own separate spiel too. And then Mm -hmm. you watch a video of like what pregnancy looks like and all like just basic information. Mm -hmm. Now it has turned into you have overstepped your boundaries. Mm -hmm. Um, Our kids are reading books on different positions. They're reading porn, literally porn, literally porn. There was a mayor and oh my gosh, I forget where this was. This was last week. A mayor of the district went to the school board meeting and all he said was, I, I demand that you either resign Wow. Because of the pornography literature that you're handed out to the stu- students of the school district, or you will have a lawsuit against you and we will have you, f- like, you will be gone. There will be justice. Wow. Um, so we've taken the words sex ed and we've turned it into, ooh, how else can we damage these young kids' minds, mm-hmm. you know? And so the CRT, the transgender curriculum and sex ed all kind of just come together Something was shared with me today on Instagram. It was a book that was passed out to fourth graders in school in New Jersey. And it had three images. The first image was, um, you know, uh, in, in all three images, it's a couple naked in bed. The first couple is uh, male and female having intercourse. The second image is two women having intercourse. The last image is two men having intercourse. What kind of sex ed is that? Mm. Who are you to take it into your hands? Why is this your account? What what right do you have Mm -hmm. to teach this to a child? That is something that should be discussed at home. Mm -hmm. That should be something that should be pondered upon at home. And again, that's where we're taking away the vulnerability of the kid, Mm -hmm. right? We're not Mm -hmm. saying, oh, like, don't question it. You know, we don't want you to be curious about where where kids come from or anything like that but that is absolutely not the that that is not that is doorline pornography right the books that the middle schoolers and high schoolers have been reading across the country is like it talks about you know oral sex uh, other kinds of, of of sexual intercourse and like you know there was a book about uh, um uh, like family involved mm-hmm. sex wow. like incest and it's just it's just that is not sex ed. Mm-hmm. That's that's not appropriate. That should not be in the classroom. Teach these kids how to, you know, put numbers together. Mm-hmm. My high schoolers don't know how many pennies are in a dollar, mm-hmm. but you're going to throw a book at them that depicts uh, two men having intercourse. Right. I think in order to to preserve the vulnerability and the innocence of our children, we have to have boundaries. And I think that's what we're talking about here, right? Is being able to have boundaries. And this is like not even within the realms of any sort of boundaries, I think. I think it's completely overstepping. And we wonder why we have a hypersexual world and community and society. And I think it starts at such a young age, right? Them reading, basically it's literature that is pornographic, that leading them into their own pornographic journey. Go look at any of the psychological effects of, of over use of porn or use of porn over a very long term you know period of time and how it's affecting relationships and marriages and even just single people in general and the psychological effects the damage it's occurring and I think that all of this feeds into that and it's not good it's not healthy it's not producing good healthy human beings it's not producing good results so why would we allow this to happen at such a young age like 
once you're an adult, do whatever it is that you want to do. Right. But Mm -hmm. before that time, I think that's where we have to step in and say what is allowed and what is not allowed. And I think there's so many more parents now standing up saying this is a hard no, like this is a hard boundary for me um, that I'm hopeful that we see change in this. I saw recently there's been quite a few videos of these books being um, read out loud at school at school meetings. Um, And it was cool because I got to see an update of one of the school meetings and they threw out the book and, you know, it, it. Right. So the parents got what they were going after in that one sense. Um, But I'm really hopeful that we see some drastic change. You know, I know it can be really overwhelming when we start to become aware to things that we weren't aware of, like the CRT or the sex education and the negative view on law enforcement that we're putting on our children in school. But it's like these Mm -hmm. things have to come to light in order for things to change, in order for it to be exposed, for us to deal with it, and for us to move forward in a new direction, you know? So I'm not discouraged by all of the crazy shit that's going on and happening. Mm-hmm. I it's, it's a lot to take in, but I'm actually encouraged because now I believe that the right people and good people are standing up and creating change and creating a, self, a safer and healthier environment for the next generation. That's beautiful. And also, like, kids are already questioning their sexuality, right? Like they're going Mm -hmm. through puberty, they're going through, you know, um, body, their bodies are changing, everything is changing. And then you tell them, oh, there's an unlimited amount of genders. There's Mm -hmm. 52 genders, your gender can change every day, you can do this, you can do that. It's like, dude, how do you expect these kids to function like just normal human beings? Like, you have totally just destroyed their childhood. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's harmful. But when you asked, you know, how can parents get involved? Mm-hmm. At this point, you have to ask yourself, do you want to repeat the last year and a half? And it's going to be worse. Mm-hmm. Um, do you, are you comfortable with your, with your kid going to school with their face covered, with social distancing, with the curriculum? They can't uh, participate in a sport unless they take the experimental juice. Are you okay? You know what? Don't even ask yourself if you're okay with that. Don't be greedy. Talk to your child. Mm-hmm. Because guess what? Your child is stuck between the government and you. And if you are just as brainwashed and you are just as complicit as government, then your kid is stuck between two hard rocks. Mm -hmm. What do you expect your kid to do? Have a conversation with your child. Honey, what do you like? Mm -hmm. What do you want to see? Every time I go into a home, whether I'm there for private lessons or I'm there to give them tutoring or anything, I have those conversations with the parents because it just naturally comes up. And I could see, you know, one of the high schoolers saying, yeah, I hate school. I just want to be homeschooled. So for parents that are kind of questioning themselves, like, I don't know if this is the right thing to do, blah, 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 blah. I just want to tell you that there's newfound business in that. Like you won't be the only homeschooling family in your community at all. And there are so many teachers like me who have walked away from the system who are eager to work with families like yourself to give your kids a well-rounded education. There are homeschool co-op programs. There are, you know, Facebook groups that you can talk about different curriculum and things like that. But I just want you all to know that there is relief for you out there. There's relief for your kids out there. So first and foremost, you know, check out those websites, just get educated. Number two, have a very extensive conversation with your child. Your child is the one dealing with this. You drop them off at the school bus with the mask for eight hours, right? They're gone at school for eight hours. You walk back home and you go back into the living room in your PJs and you work virtually all day. Your kid is suffering. So have that conversation with your kid. And then number three, ultimately make the decision together as a family. What is best for all of you together. Mm -hmm. Financially, it can happen. It is, it is not unattainable. There are free resources out there. There's free curriculum out there. There are teachers like me out there that will take care of that process for you. So it's ultimately up to you now. That's beautiful. And I love that you segued into that because as you were talking, I was going to ask you exactly about that. (laughs) And I hope that teachers that are listening can also see the opportunity in this. So if you're a teacher that is not with everything that's happening and you are thinking about making that transition, 
there are a lot of families and there are a lot of students that are going to need a teacher outside of the home as well. So get creative in your thinking of how you can make a living for yourself. There is opportunity of making a living for yourself as an educator outside of the system. And it's beautiful because you can choose who you work with. You can create your own environment. So I would encourage you to really think outside of the box on that one and get excited about being able to educate in a way that the family agrees with, that you're on board with, and in a safe environment where you can all take a big, deep breath. (laughs) (laughs) That's right. Well, hey, is there anything else that we didn't really go into on this podcast um, that you would like to address or speak on or a certain group that you would like to talk to? Um, I love that you're so passionate about what you do, that you, about <laughs> what you do. You're so outspoken. Um, and I know everyone's going to go follow you on Instagram. But is there any last thing that you kind of wanted to cover with everyone? The ultimate way to really get involved and fight back and win is if you form an alliance, whether you're a parent or a teacher or a student, you have to form an alliance within your community. Parents, you form an alliance with other pissed off parents in your community. You put your foot down and you basically sign an agreement and you say, we are not sending our kids off to school with a mask. We will not comply. If 10, 15, 20 kids in each school building shows up with a, to school without a face mask, you have won. They cannot touch your kids. They cannot kick your children out. They cannot physically touch your child. Power in numbers, so that's for parents. For students, you do the same exact thing. You collectively band together with as students and you say, we will strike, we will not comply with the masks and we will not comply with the forced needle. We will not be in this uh, athletic program unless you allow us to make our own choices. Same goes for the teachers. You should not be coerced into doing this at all either form that alliance with other teachers band together and the most beautiful thing that could come out of this is if you're not separated the parent coalition the teacher coalition and student coalition will naturally come together if you have this kind of community in your area and it doesn't matter what the political arena is it's not political it's life or death Mm -hmm. it's freedom or communism Mm -hmm. so form that alliance, have a uh, like group agreement that we will not comply. And now you have group effort and power and number and you will win. Amen. I got chills. <laughs> Just imagining the parents, teachers and students all together. Oof, that's going to be powerful. Oh, yeah. You know, ultimately, the power is in your hands. You will feel you will feel discouraged because you might show up for a year and a half straight like we have here in Virginia and go speak at these school board meetings. And then ultimately, they still pass a policy. They still pass these bills. But don't be discouraged because the corruption has always been around for a very long, long time. I want you, like, as Emily said, be encouraged because now you have this information in front of you. The power is in your hands. The ball is in your court. So be empowered. There are so many people that have your back. There are so many teachers that have your back. There are so many people like Emily, who's not even a teacher, not even a parent, who has your back and will give you a voice. So for parents, you know, have those uncomfortable conversations with your spouse and your kids and figure out what it is that you need to do, but ultimately take the power into your hands. The child belongs to you and not the government. Um, For teachers, you have to ask yourself, you know, how far are you willing to go? If you are still in the system, um, there are coalition of teachers everywhere that are forming. I'm not even kidding. They're literally underground coalition of teachers forming everywhere. Get together with those teachers, band together and file lawsuits together and get your voices heard. Um, You know, that's one thing that you can do. Ultimately, you don't work for the school board. You work for the kids. Then the last thing for kids is, you know, go home and tell your parents what the heck is going on, Mm -hmm. right? Like if you want us to have your back, you need to talk to your parents about what is going on. Mm -hmm. Be very like open with your family. They want to help you. They love you. And just know that you are the one dealing with this all day. If you don't like it, if something is bothering you, have that relationship to go home and talk to your parents about it. But ultimately for everybody listening, don't lose hope. They want you to feel discouraged, but there's no reason to because your kids are still yours. And hey, we win at the end of the day. (laughs) That's right. (laughs) That was so beautiful, so helpful, so much uh, real tangible resources for people. So honestly, thank you from the bottom of my heart for sharing your passion, your heart, and just everything that you did with our audience today. 
Thank you. It's my pleasure. Thank you for giving us a voice. You've had incredible people on your podcast. Mm -hmm. And so thank you for giving us a voice. Always. I'm always here for that. And I, I would love if anyone's listening and feels like they have something they need to say or needs, you know, their voice heard on a certain issue or a different profession, please reach out to me. You know, I would love to like, there's only so much I can do within my own field. So I love more than ever connecting with other people in their fields to, you know, let their voices be heard and also allow other people to connect with them as well. Um, last thing, where can people find you? You might want to include your backup one as well. (laughs) Yeah. So I'm just on Instagram because I hate social media, but on Instagram, I'm teachers for truth. So teachers underscore for underscore truth. And then my backup is the same thing. It just says backup at the end. Okay. Perfect. Well, thank you again for being on the show. Everyone listening, if you enjoyed today's podcast, please do me a favor, rate and review the show. That's the way that the show grows. Share it with a friend, send it to a teacher, send it to a parent, send it to a student. Let's get everybody listening and everybody joining forces so that we can work together to create the change that we all want to see. Thank you guys so much for listening to another episode of Evolve with Emily, and I will see you in the next one. Bye guys.